and welcome back to Valerie and Valise, the YouTube channel where you can get everything you need to know to visit Alaska, both in 2023 and in the future. Uh, my name is Valerie. I am your host, and I am very excited to be back for another video in my Alaska seminar series for 2023. So if you have been following along, these are a series of videos that I am conducting with different destinations around Alaska to make sure that you have the most accurate and up-to-date information to plan your trip in 2023. But each video has some more evergreen information. So in this video, where I'll be chatting with someone from Travel Juno. I'm very excited you're going to learn the basics of visiting Juno any year, as well as some particularly interesting and exciting things that are happening this year. Um, I'm really excited because I believe that Ben from Travel Juno, who's joined me, uh, I think you did the video with me a few years ago. So we're kind of making a habit of this. It's very exciting to have you back. I know that we were able to actually meet in person after we did the video last time, and that was awesome. And Unlike last time, I believe last time I did just a panel of Southeast Alaska. Now Southeast Alaska destinations each get their own video because I am so excited to share the different unique things. And I want you all to have plenty of time and space to do that. So we are going to be here for the next half an hour to 45 minutes, depending on how many questions we get. We're going to start off with Ben doing uh, an introduction to Juno and everything you need to know. And then if you have any questions, you can pop them into the chat panel here on the live stream. If you are watching this replay, you can put them in the comments on the YouTube video and I will see them and I'll, I can get them to Ben if I don't know the answer myself. Uh, and we'll cover some other housekeeping stuff at the end, but let's get right to it. Thank you so much for joining me, Ben. Yeah, thanks for having me, Valerie. Uh, before we dive into the excitement of coming to Juno, uh, we do want to acknowledge that Juno sits on the traditional lands of the Clinket, Haida, and Shimshian Alaskan natives. Uh, they have been in Alaska since time immemorial, and we value their stewardship of the land in the past, the present, and in the future. Uh, Perfect. Anyone who is coming to Juneau, uh, you know, it's the hub of Southeast Alaska, and I'm, I'm really glad that each part of uh, Southeast is kind of getting their own moment to shine with you, Valerie, because there really is so, so much to do. Um, you know, Alaska is a, an immense, immense place. Um, and I think that one of the most beautiful things about Southeast is that it kind of condenses and uh, it kind of condenses down all of the different things that Alaska offers. Um, and we'll kind of get into a little bit of that in the next coming slides. But uh, for anyone who is looking to come to Juneau, uh, it is the state capital. Uh, it was the state capital in 1906, uh, which is actually 53 years before Alaska became a U.S. state. Um, and even though Juneau is only about 30,000 people, and it is located on about 14 square miles of developed land, uh, the municipality of Juneau entirely is over 3,000 square miles. It's actually the largest municipal city in the United States by square mileage. Um, when we look at environment and stuff like that, we do sit in a temperate rainforest. And so be sure to pack your rain jacket. Uh, we get about 71 inches of rain, 80 inches of snow each year. Um, that 80 of inches is down in town. We get hundreds of inches up in the mountains. Uh, and that temperate climate uh, is really a huge benefit because we stay nice and cool in the summer, mid 70s Fahrenheit. Uh, and then we stay nice and warm nice and warm in the winter with low 30s being our average uh, temperature. So regardless of when you come, that's kind of what you can expect. Uh, but we'll dive in in uh, how to get there. Uh, and so next slide, Valerie. Yeah, and so one thing that is notable about Juneau, uh, which is a bit of a departure from some of the other areas in the state like uh, Anchorage or Fairbanks, is there we are not on the road system. Uh, and so you cannot drive your car to Juno. Uh, the only way to get here is by sea or by air. Uh, and we have lots of different options and there are pros and cons to each, uh, each choice you have. Uh, if you do decide to come by sea, that's going to be the scenic route, so to speak. Um, you're going to be coming up on the Alaska Marine Highway, which has routes that run from Seattle, Canada, the other communities in Alaska. And so it kind of interconnects everything. Uh, and it is actually a, recognized as a highway system. Um, and so you can get on the ferry. You can put your boat on the ferry. Uh, instead of a two-hour flight, you're looking at a three-day cruise, slow cruise, uh, through southeast. Um, 
and it's really really beautiful it's one of the most authentic ways to experience the region and it's a really great tool if you want to spend a couple days in multiple communities throughout southeast uh, but not everyone has that time not everyone wants to spend that much time on the boat um, and so if you do want to come to Juneau another way we do have uh, daily jet flights um, Alaska Airlines and Delta service Juno daily during the summer. Um, Alaskan has direct routes from Fairbanks, Anchorage, and Seattle, uh, and Delta flies direct from Seattle. All of those flights are about two hours one way. Uh, and so we are kind of right in the middle between Seattle and Anchorage. Uh, it's only about a two hour flight from Seattle to Juno, which is uh, usually pretty shocking for people. People think it's gonna be a lot farther away, uh, but it's pretty convenient actually. And we'll go ahead to the next slide. Oh no, there are my pictures. Okay. Uh, and so we'll kind of dive into uh, the different seasons that Juno has, the different uh, times to come and what you can expect depending on when you're here. Uh, and we'll start with winter because that's where we are. Um, for, for Juno, we consider winter to be November to March. So it is kind of our longest season. Uh, and it does translate to darker days, cooler temperatures, but uh, by no means is it any less fun. Um, I myself, I came up to Juneau uh, to be an ice climbing guide back in 2019. And so I love the winter aspect of Juneau, skiing, ice climbing, all of that stuff. Uh, and so if you are a snow sports lover or a snow enthusiast, Juneau is a really great winter market to visit. Um, we do have a ski hill. It's called Eagle Crest Ski Area. It's a city-owned local hill. It has four lifts. There is some exciting development happening that we'll talk about later, uh, but you know, very few people realize that Juno does have a ski hill. And you know, I would be willing to bet that you could fly to Juno and be skiing faster than if you started in Seattle and drove to one of the Seattle region ski hills. Uh, and so that nice local uh, small prices, small lift lines. That kind of thing. Um, other things to do in the winter, um, we do have incredible heli skiing. Uh, for those who are familiar with uh, the ski industry, Teton Gravity Research has been to Juneau the last four years in a row uh, to film some of their big mountain heli ski riding uh, features. And that's pretty exciting. It's world-class uh, sport that we have up here. Uh, we do also have the Northern Lights. They aren't quite as consistent as they are in other parts of the state. Uh, but if you are looking to do the Aurora Borealis, winter is when you want to come for that, for the nice dark skies. Uh, our spring season runs April to May. Uh, and this is a really exciting time in Juneau because everybody, everything is kind of waking back up. Waking back up from the winter hibernation, so to speak. Um, our whales are returning. Uh, they're finishing that 3,000 mile migration back from Hawaii. Uh, the hiking trails are starting to, you know, be exposed after the snow melt. Uh, and then there's still some really exciting backcountry heli skiing options for you as well. In the summer, uh, this is probably what most people think of when they think about coming to Alaska. Um, that season is June to August. And that's really where we have the most robust wildlife viewing, whether that's bear viewing or whale watching. That's when most of the salmon runs are taking place. So our fishing industry is in full full gear mode. Uh, and that's also when it's the nicest to go for a hike, have a bonfire on the beach, stuff like that. Uh, and then finally fall, uh, September to October, it's spring, but the opposite. Uh, everything is starting to slow down. We've had a really busy uh, summer full of daylight and adventures and things are kind of starting to wind down a lot. Uh, fall is when you'll really see a lot of community events starting to happen in Juneau. And so people are kind of coming back from their outdoor adventures. They're reconnecting with their friends, reconnecting with uh, advocacy groups, special interest groups. And so that's when we have a lot of uh, dinner parties and concerts, art shows, that kind of stuff. All right, next slide. Regardless of uh, when you're coming, um, you know, Juno will always have something for you to do. Um, 
And, you know, we're putting a, a really big emphasis on cultural tourism. Um, it is something that the entire state is working really hard to develop uh, and you know, kind of raising awareness of that culture and giving a platform for those voices. Um, in Juneau, we have the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. Uh, they just completed a brand new arts building in 2021. They had a really exciting uh, expose in Smithsonian about Juno being the epicenter of Alaskan native art. Uh, and so we're really, really excited to work with Sea Alaska and you know, to develop that uh, markets, tours, art classes, that kind of stuff. Uh, and we also have a really exciting development, uh, Auk Rock Music Festival. Uh, it is the United States' first entirely indigenous music festival. And so while it's not all Alaskan natives, all of the musicians from around the world are, uh, are indigenous uh, descent. Uh, and so it's really, really exciting for that to be happening in Juneau. Um, it's going to be in its second year, happening in September in 2023. We're really excited to develop that further. Uh, and then water, land, and air are just kind of the general ways that you can interact with Juno's outdoors. Um, from water, you can view glaciers, you can whale watch, you can go on a fishing tour, uh, you can rent a kayak, go on a canoe tour. A lot of those uh, tour options kind of combine several of those, uh, you know, and so you might be on a whale watch, but you're going to be seeing glaciers on it, vice versa sort of thing. Uh, and then by land, uh, Juno has over 250 miles of hiking trails. We have more maintained hiking trails than we do paved roads. Um, and so the opportunities are literally boundless. Um, if you want to get out onto a hike, Juno is an incredible place to do it. Um, you can walk to the glaciers, you can view whales from the shore, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, and then finally, air. Um, you know, most people get an incredible flight scene tour when they fly into Juno from Seattle. Uh, but if you can't get enough of it, it's very easy to charter a plane, go on a flight scene tour. Um, we have four helicopter operators in town that have a combination of glacier viewing tours, just general flight scene tours. And we'll talk a little bit about the Taku Lodge that is celebrating its 100th anniversary uh, in a couple slides. But th that's usually the way to interact with uh, kind of Juno's outdoors environments. And next slide, we will cover kind of the indoors, so to speak. Uh, so Juno does have a surprisingly vibrant downtown. Uh, one of the things that we hear most from people who first come to Juno it's a little bit bigger than they expect, and there are more options than they expect. Um, downtown Juno is super convenient and super consolidated. Um, it spans roughly six square blocks, um, but in that you have tons of unique shopping experiences, boutiques, art galleries, native Alaskan art, uh, and, and much more. And our food is equally fun. Um, for a small town off the road system, Juno boasts an incredibly vibrant food scene. We have multiple chefs that have been nominated for James Beard Awards. We have multiple chefs that have performed and even won in the Great American Seafood Cook-Off. Um, and all of that talent, you know, it really cultivates uh, an environment for e exploration and continued excellence. Uh, People will regularly say that food is one of the most important ways to travel, uh, and Juno definitely provides in that area. Kind of adjacent to that, we, uh, we do have our breweries. We have four uh, craft breweries and one gin and uh, whiskey distillery. Uh, and so between food and that brewing scene, uh, there's a massive emphasis on locally sourced ingredients. And so if you're going to be getting fresh Alaskan seafood, you're going to be getting spruce tip beers. Um, you know, it's, it's really exciting to see people kind of bring in and incorporate the outdoors that plays such a big part of our lives in Juneau and your experience when you come and visit. And to see that incorporated in food and drink is really exciting. And then finally, uh, we do have an incredible... Uh, art and music scene. Um, I mentioned earlier the Ock Rock Music Festival that happens every other year. Uh, in the alternate years, we have celebration 
which is a week long celebration of Alaskan native culture that, you know, parades down the street in Juneau, incredible dances, music, all of that. Um, and then we do have as well a wearable arts, uh, which is kind of a, it's an art show that incorporates recycled use for clothing. Um, we have public markets, first Fridays are always a bustling time downtown, and we even have monthly drag shows as well. And then uh, next slide, go ahead. Sorry, one, one second. That's okay. So while we're waiting for Ben to come back online, I will say that I love seeing these craft distilleries. So if you are watching this video, the craft distilleries and craft breweries movement in Alaska has been really exciting. Um, if you, sh you should also go check out the Skagway video because in that video, Wendy talked about that they have distilleries and craft breweries and they're also using spruce tip ale. If you don't go to Alaska and try spruce tip ale, even if it's just a little sip, if you're not really someone who likes beer or drinks beer, I would highly recommend just trying it because it's very unique. It's very Alaskan. It's I think it's delicious. Uh, and there's obviously many places you can enjoy it. So definitely recommend seeking that out if you're looking for one of those uniquely Alaskan flavors. Yeah, that's a great tip, Valerie. And, and you're exactly right. You know, there is um, quite a bit of overlap through Southeast, a lot of themes. Uh, we all share very similar environments, very similar resources. Uh, and that also applies to our wildlife. Um, Juneau sits in the Tongass National Forest, which is the largest national forest in the U.S. forest system. Uh, and it is a rainforest. You know, the, all that rain that I talked about earlier um, provides a very vibrant, lush landscape uh, for some really incredible wildlife. Wildlife is a big factor in most people's decision to come to Alaska. And so going to do a quick little talk about what you can expect to see here in Juneau. Uh, you can definitely expect to see bears, uh, both black bears and coastal brown bears, uh, as well as uh, whales. We have roughly 600 whales that call Juneau home uh, every summer. They are seasonal, so they do migrate. Um, and so, you know, really wanting to be here from May to September, that's going to be your peak whale watching season. Uh, and then lots and lots of bald eagles. Um, there are about 30,000 people in Juneau, and there are about 30,000 bald eagles that call the greater Juneau area home as well. So uh, really incredible to see just driving down the highway, you know, 20 bald eagles sitting in a tree right next to the road. Uh, and then, of course, salmon. Uh, can't not talk about the fisheries when you're talking about Southeast Alaska. Uh, Juneau is home to all five kinds of salmon. And then those salmon will run throughout the summer. And so depending on what salmon you're looking to see, what salmon you're looking to catch, you'll have different uh, peak times to interact with those activities. Uh, some notable mentions that didn't quite make it onto the slide just because they are a little bit more rare or maybe not quite as exciting, but we do have orcas in Southeast Alaska, as well as sea lions and halibut. And then of course, ravens, mountain goats, deer, wolves, uh, it is important to note that because of our location, the big game that is often associated with Alaska will not be seen here in Juneau. So we do not have moose, we do not have elk in the Juneau area. And so with that, we're going to kind of switch over to what's new and what's coming to town. Um, we have some really exciting developments. Like I said, cultural tourism is something that we're really working hard to develop. Um, that Ock Rock Music Festival, again, front and center there. Um, two years ago, they brought over 20 international artists to Juno, and sh all of them shared their indigenous cultural musical roots with us. It was uh, an incredible, it was humbling, um, and the fact that it will be happening every two years is really exciting. Um, that will be taking place in September of this year. And we're also kind of concurrently working on a major renovation of Juno's waterfront. Um, the Huna Totem Corporation is working on building a new dock for Juno, so we could be able to accommodate a fifth cruise ship if needed. Um, and with that development also comes um, the installation of 30 totem poles uh, along Juno's waterfront, 10 of which have already been commissioned thanks to a $3 million federal grant. So very, very exciting to see all of that coming. Uh, that totem pole walk would be interactive and right there on the Juno waterfront. 
We are also helping uh, the Taku Lodge celebrate 100 years of operation. The Taku Lodge sits uh, about a 30-minute float plane flight south of Juneau, and it was one of Alaska's first hunting lodges. Today, it is accessible during a day trip through Wings Airways, where you take that float plane across the glacial field, land on the Taku River, have an all-you-can-eat salmon buffet, and then they fly you back across the glaciers. Um, and then we also have a new tour that's coming to Juneau that's a pretty exciting fusion of uh, wildlife and nature viewing and historical significance. Uh, the Juno Lighthouse Tour will be operating for their first summer this year, uh, and it involves about an hour boat ride to the Sentinel Island Lighthouse, where you actually will be able to disembark, walk around the grounds of the lighthouse, and all the way there and all the way back, you're looking at glaciers, uh, whales. If you get lucky, you might see a killer whale. Uh, and then finally, to kind of bring it back full circle to the winter activities of, that Juno has to offer, um, our Eagle Crest Ski Area has had a has purchased a gondola, uh, and we're really excited because that will let the ski area operate both winter and summer. The gondola will open uh, the ski area boundaries to mountain biking, hiking, you know, a beautiful panoramic restaurant where you can get an Alaskan spruce tip beer at the top. Uh, and then in the winter, it will also expand that ski area boundary to you know incorporate more of that landscape as well. So there you have it. That's uh, Juno in 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm sold. Uh, yep, I'm sold. There's so many exciting yep. things happening in Juno, and it just makes me very glad that I got to come out. I've been out several times in the past few years and yeah. apparently need to come back again because there's more new developments happening. Uh, okay, just confirming we got through. Oh, you have a bunch of photos. We have to make sure we highlight photos. Look at all this. Yeah, just a little photo slide when we talk about the Q&As. So. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so let's jump right into the Q&As. Um, I've got a handful of them. So let's see. Okay, so this is going to kind of tie in a little bit with what we were talking about with regard to some of the, both of, it sounds like the focus for Travel Juno in part, as well as um, just the reality of being in the capital city. So here's a question from Brittany um, saying, you know, what are some of the top Alaska Native cultural experiences you can have? And then also things you can do regarding the fact that it's the, got the state capital and there's some state history here. Yeah, absolutely. This is a great question. Um, you know, starting with the Alaska Native experiences, um, you know, over the last couple of years, Juno has really worked to incorporate that culture into the everyday life of Juno. So you're going to see uh, Alaska Native murals, Alaska Native art all over the place. Um, we just did, we just finished a wayfinding tour. And so it's, it's signage that is dotted throughout downtown Juno uh, with, with maps and QR codes. And if you scan that QR code, it takes you to um, a, an Alaska Native talking about what you're seeing. And so you're standing on a street corner looking at these beautiful mountaintops and you can be listening to an Alaska Native talk to you about what that mountaintop is significant for. Um, it's, a, it's a really well done, beautiful uh, experience. It's completely self-navigatable. Uh, and so you just kind of grab a coffee and walk around downtown getting that experience as you go. Uh, See Alaska Heritage Institute is working on bringing and opening up their art workshops to the general public. And so we're really excited to work with them and help them make that possible. Um, and then finally, you know, for the Alaska Native cultural experience kind of is, as well as the state and capital history, uh, we do have some incredible museums. Uh, with us being the capital, uh, we are very lucky to have the State Museum here in Juneau. It is an incredible experience um, from someone who really thoroughly enjoys museums but can kind of quickly get uh, burnt out on them. You know, if one if it's too big or has too much information, uh, the State Museum is it's like the perfect size. It does a really good job of walking you through the history and so you uh and it has an incredible emphasis on the alaska native culture that expands throughout the entire state not just here in juneau uh, but we also do have the juneau uh museum which kind of focuses more on the traditions and the peoples that were right in the juneau area 
Amazing. I don't think I knew there was a Juno Museum, so that's now on my list also. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, um, and it's then, right across from the state or the city hall. Okay, now I know. Uh, and then one more thing, I, this is sort of a tie-in question. Can you visit the state capitol? Can you go inside? Are there tours, anything like that? You can. Um, that is arranged through the city museum. And okay. so uh, something, you know, in the pre-COVID days, um, you would be able to walk into the lobby of the Capitol and you know, kind of see it for yourself, but they have stopped that. And so if you are interested in going and seeing the Capitol building, you can just go right across the street to the city museum and one of their staff, if available, will, will cross over and you know, help you do a Capitol tour that way. Awesome. Yeah. I know for many people, Juno is their 50th of 50 state capitals <laughs> because yep. they end up making it to Hawaii before they make it up to Alaska. So no, that's yep. an important question, even though that wasn't Brittany's question. All right. Here's another one for you. Um, we didn't really talk about it very much, but there is a tram that goes more or less there from is. where most of the cruise ships dock up Mount Roberts called the Mount Roberts Tramway. And Lisa obviously knew that there was a tram and she wants to know just what is there to do when you get to the top? Is it worth doing, you know, what do you see? It is absolutely worth doing. Um, so the, the Gold Belt Mount Roberts Tram uh, rises just under 2000 feet above uh, the Lynn Canal and the Gastineau Channel. Uh, it is the easiest way to kind of get that bird's eye view of Juneau and the Southeast Alaska landscape. Um, specifically at the top of the tram, uh, there are lots of things to do. So you have the, within the infrastructure of the tram, you have a restaurant, you have, which has some of the best fish and chips in all of Juneau. Um, you also have a little bar there, so you can enjoy one of those spruce tip beers. Um, obviously, there is also kind of a historical uh, aspect to it. So the Gold Belt uh, Foundation is one of the Alaska Native Corps here in Alaska. And so there's a little bit of history about that corporation and about the tram, as well as an interpretive center for the nature and the landscapes that you're seeing. And then the tram is kind of the launching off point for a pretty large system of trails. And so once you get to the top of the tram, you know, get 1800 feet above, and then you can keep hiking up for up to two, 3000 feet, uh, depending on how long of a hike you want to go for. Nice. And then um, I know there's a gift shop up there, which some people are like, oh, gift shop, but it's, it's a great gift shop, right? It has a lot of Alaska native made products and made in Alaska products as well, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Gold Belt being a native Alaskan corporation puts a massive emphasis on uh, promoting that art, promoting that culture. And so that uh, gift shop is, it, it kind of doubles as an art gallery, to be completely yeah. honest. Yeah, yeah, it really does. I, I was astounded and wanted to take basically all of it home. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> so let's jump to another major Juno attraction. Um, if you do any research into Juneau, you discover there is a very easily accessible glacier, uh, which is fantastic. It's a great offering, um, but it's not near downtown Juneau, which a lot of people get a little bit confused about when they're doing their research. So um, in the case for most cruise passengers, there are transfers and tours provided. But if you're visiting Juneau on your own, which is sort of, you know, a lot of the questions that I get because I cover more independent travel, um, there's a shuttle. And is it easy to take? Do you can you share some of the details about how you take the shuttle out to the glacier? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, with with cruising being a large part of Juno's tourism ecosystem, a lot of the tours will start and end close to the cruise ships. But as an independent traveler, that does not mean you don't get to take those cruises. It just means that's where they leave from. And so if you do see, if you think that because they're close to the cruise ships, you can't go, that is not true at all. That's just kind of where that infrastructure is built. And so the shuttle to the Mendenhall Glacier leaves every 15 to 20 minutes during the summer. Um, and it is remarkably easy uh, because of the uh, frequency that the shuttle runs. Uh, there's almost always a seat on. You just kind of walk up to one of the stalls or you call ahead, get your ticket. They'll tell you what color bus to go to and all of that. They make it very clear. Um, and it's about a 30 to 45 minute drive to the Mendenhall Glacier once you're on the shuttle. Um, and when you're at the glacier, it is 
it's super convenient. Um, so the visitor center is right there. There are, once again, hiking trails where you can get closer to the glacier. You can go view some waterfalls. There's some really incredible um, interpretive history on those trails as well, you know, telling you uh, this year, this was where the ice was, that kind of thing. Um, and then once you are content with that experience, you just basically go right back to the same stop that the shuttle dropped you off at, and you take the next one into downtown. Um, so Mendenhall, it is not a time limit or anything like that. It's completely open-ended. You just get onto the next shuttle, the next available shuttle when you are ready to head back in. And that's part of why being an independent traveler is awesome is that you have that flexibility in your own schedule to decide when you want to, how long you want to spend out there when you want to go back. Absolutely. Great question, Sherry. Yep. Sherry sent me lots of questions. I'm really excited that we get to answer her questions for her. Yeah. Okay. Here's a specific one for you. There's someone who is coming in on a cruise ship for the 4th of July. Uh, what does the Capitol do to celebrate? Yeah. Uh, so uh, July 4th is a, a pretty big deal in Juneau. Um, now, for this question specifically, I might not have good news uh, because Juno actually holds our fireworks show at midnight on July 3rd. And so between that decision to hold it at midnight, uh, and I'll get into why in just a second, and the fact that we are behind uh, in the time zones for the U.S., it actually makes us one of the first fireworks shows for all of the U.S., um, which is kind of fun. The reason why we do it at midnight is because uh, on July 4th, we are only two weeks away from the summer solstice. And so we don't really have dark skies um, to do fireworks in. And so midnight has kind of, it's about the only time that you can have a fireworks show and really be able to see the fireworks uh, with the sun down. And so, you know, that's the decision to do it as opposed to on the 4th. Um, but on that day, on July 4th, there's still a lot happening. Uh, we have a parade that goes through all of downtown Juneau, uh, lots of vendors, lots of specials. You know, it's always just fun to watch the fire trucks and antique cars come down the road. And then there's a full July 4th festival that happens on Douglas Island. And so that same parade will go through Douglas Island as well. Um, but usually Douglas Island has um, lots of food vendors, festival games, that kind of stuff built out as well. Amazing. I, I yeah. will say the the 3rd of July thing, it, as a kid growing up in Alaska and Eagle River, we did the same thing. It was the 3rd of July and that's actually my mom's birthday. So we always sort of joked that it was, you know, fireworks for my mom's birthday and for Absolutely. America. Um, yeah. But it's something that I didn't realize was really unusual until I left Alaska. Because <laughs> of yeah. course, <laughs> if you try and do the fireworks like most cities do on the 4th of July, which is, I don't know, maybe eight, eight o'clock at night, you're not going to see them. It's too light out. So we have to get creative in Alaska. So unfortunately, if you are visiting Alaska for the 4th of July and hoping to see fireworks, you won't want to research both in Juneau and elsewhere. Now you have, now you know for Juneau, but for elsewhere to see when they do their fireworks, because it, it may not be the 4th of July, but it's just because of the way Alaska works. One of those quirky fun things. Yeah. Okay. So let's do this one next. Um, Jasmine is curious what there is to do in the before and after cruise season. So maybe like the April and May, you said spring and then September, October and autumn, as well as in the winter. Um, you did cover winter pretty well. So maybe we'll focus on the, the before and after cruise season. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that shoulder season in Juneau can be a really exciting time. Um, April and May, uh, the cruises have started to come in. Uh, seasonal workers are starting to come in, but uh, one really fun event that happens every April in Juneau is Alaskan Folk Fest. And so uh, music, uh, folk musicians from all across the country, all across the world, descend on Juneau. Um, and it's it's organized, but it's also not. Um, but there, there's so much happening and there are so many musicians in town that no matter what restaurant you walk in, no matter what bar you walk in, no matter what time of day you're doing it, there will almost always be a pop-up folk band uh, of, you know, one person brings a fiddle, one person bangs on a bar stool, the other person has a guitar. Uh, it's it's a really, really fun. It's, a, it's an incredible week. Um, highly encourage you all to come and experience that in April. Uh, on the other side, uh, you know, kind of fall, Again, you're looking at 
you know, Alaskans kind of coming back in from the outside. And so there are going to be lots of music opportunities. That's when the Ock Rock Music Festival will be. Um, we have the Juno Beer Fest, which is, you know, all of those breweries from Juno, but then all of the breweries from Southeast and other parts of the state come in and we have our own little beer fest. Um, you know, and really it is, it's the daily things that make for a pretty vibrant scene. So on Wednesdays, there's karaoke at the Alaskan. On Thursday, there is open mic at the Crystal Saloon. Every first Friday of the month, uh, all the bars and restaurants put a different local artist onto their walls. And so you get a different thing to look at. Um, you know, it's, it's just a really, really exciting time. Yeah, I feel like they're doing these videos. And even I visited Alaska in the autumn. I mean, I live there too. But I've realized that the autumn, while maybe not what you might expect from a traditional tourism standpoint, you know, a lot of tourists start to shut down. The seasonal workers are going maybe back to school or back home it's when the Alaskans get to enjoy Alaska and there's a big kind of celebration. It's not like a organized, but there's just a lot of joy about that time of year of ah, another great summer season and seeing each other before we start to all have to bundle up before we go outside. So it's very fun to hear all these different activities that are happening in Juneau and other parts of the state. Yeah. And I will say, Jasmine, if you are a hiker, um, that fall season can be when it, some of the best hiking uh, through all of the state is uh, because you're getting to that fine point where, uh, you know, that summer rain and that summer sun has melted a lot of that snow away and the fresh snow hasn't quite started to fall. Uh, and so it's my personal opinion that September and October are, are some of the best hiking months to be had. Uh, the weather's cooler, the trails are clear. Uh, it's a really great time to be outside as well. Great advice. Okay, let's see. We'll do one more because I want to be respectful okay. of your time. Okay, here's a good one. So this one comes from Carrie. Um, and I'm going to just caveat this one that you are, this is an opportunity for you, Ben, to either give your personal recommendations or to shout out some of the partners who maybe don't work directly with the cruise ships, but you know are just awesome experiences to have in Juno. So the question is, what do you do in Juno if you don't want to or are not planning to do a cruise excursion of some kind? Oh, gosh. Man, a tough okay. choice. <laughs> it is, it is. Um, and you know, there is, there isn't a whole lot um, that cruisers can't do. Uh, and so it, that makes it a little bit challenging, but. Um, well, it can be something I, that cruisers can do, but if there's anything that doesn't go in there, this is also a chance to check. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, I think my, my number one thing is try and get a cabin and I'm going to kick myself a little bit, but, um, you know, try to, or not even necessarily a cabin, try to spend a night camping somewhere out in nature. Um, Juno is remarkably accessible. Um, we're talking, if you have room for uh, a sleeping bag, uh, and a, a tent between you and your travel companion, um, you can feel, you can walk 50 feet, a hundred feet and feel like you are in the middle of the wilderness. You can wake up to the sound of whales, uh, spouting offshore. You can wake up to the sound of bald eagles calling, uh, you know, grab a, a bundle of firewood from the store, some things for s'mores, um, that experience will probably be the closest thing to it'll be the closest thing to show you why we all live up there um, because that those are the moments um, and I say this and you might think well I don't have room for that or I don't have time for that or anything like that to be quite honest neither do any of us um, you know summer is our busy season summer is when most of us are the most hectic but at the same time, we still carve out that little time to go for that 10 minute drive out the road, find a, that tiny little secluded beach. There could be a car 100 feet away from you. You won't know they're there. You won't hear them. And you'll feel like you have that entire place to yourself. And there is nothing like that. It's unmatched. It's unrivaled. Um, beyond that, uh, would highly encourage you to look at the longer tours that most of these operators will offer. 
Uh, a lot of them have kind of a condensed shorter tour that will accommodate for a cruise ship schedule. They also offer longer tours, full day tours, multi-destination tours. Um, if you get onto one of those, not only will you be surrounded by other independent travelers, which will most likely be like-minded, they'll be looking for you know friends at the bar after the tour and stuff like that, uh, but you're going to be getting a longer, more intimate experience, both with what you're seeing, whether it's coastal brown bears or ice climbing on the Mendenhall, whatever it might be, but you're also going to get a more intimate interaction with the seasonal workers that make all of this possible. Um, there are pretty incredible people that work in the seasonal industry and, uh, you know, taking a tour that gives you a couple more hours interacting with them uh, will really, will really benefit both you and them. Those are special tours to be on. Amazing. Great suggestions. <laughs> Yeah, give me that little chill of the essence of what I love about exploring Alaska as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, Ben, thank you so much for joining me, for sharing an update on what's happening in Juneau this year, convincing me I need yeah. to start planning another trip, and I'm thinking maybe September, October. We'll make that <laughs> um, happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then uh, thank you, listeners, viewers, whatever you're doing. I know a lot of people put on these YouTube videos and do multitasking. So this is the end, calling you back. Um if you have any information that you want to follow up on, be sure to check the description for this video. Uh, I've added a bunch more information, including a recap. So you might have missed a point or two while you were off washing dishes or whatever you're doing. I get it. I do it too. Um, I've also got comments open. So if you have any other questions about visiting Juno this year or at any point in the future, pop those in there. I keep an eye on them. If it's a question I can't personally answer and I need to pull in the expert expert, I will get up, I'll get an email over to Ben and get that answer for you. Um, and then if you liked this video, if it was valuable or helpful to you, please go ahead and like it here on YouTube. That is something that helps other travelers find my videos, um, this one in particular, but it helps kind of across the board. And if you generally like this video and want more videos like this or other Alaska travel videos, be sure to subscribe because I'm trying to grow my channel right now. I love providing information about Alaska. If you can't tell about my enthusiasm and ability to jump in with all kinds of other trivia and information <laughs> to complement Ben's knowledge. Um, subscribing helps me grow my channel. It helps me reach more people. It helps more people have incredible Alaska experiences and fall in love with the place that I grew up in, didn't appreciate, moved away from, and now just I'm trying to constantly get Can't back get to enough of. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So thank you again, Ben. That's it for me. That's it. We'll call it a night here. And uh, uh, thank you again for tuning in. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody.